thank you very much. I'm not going to stand behind there because I don't like barriers between me and anybody else. It's wonderful to be here and I'm very grateful to Karen for inviting me to come. You've got a beautiful campus. I know that the advising that you do here is greatly respected um, worldwide and it's wonderful to be here and uh, meet some of you and see what, what you actually do. What I'm going to do is not tell you what we do and then expect you to think that is wonderful and better than what you do. I want to learn from what you do and the whole thing that we do with NACADA, with advising, is sharing good practice and learning from each other. And so here's a view from Great Britain, from the UK. In the UK, we generally call academic advising personal tutoring and that indicates really who does it. Usually, academic and pastoral support traditionally has been delivered by academics, uh, which you call faculty. Faculty to us means something else. Does anybody know what faculty means in the UK? Except from Karen. <laughs> well, faculty, a faculty in the UK is a grouping of departments. So you might have the Faculty of Arts, which might have philosophy and history and English and languages in it, the Faculty of Science, the Faculty of Engineering. It's not a person. So what you call faculty to us would be an academic, a tutor. And traditionally, it's personal tutors, academics, who have delivered it. And many people who support this system and don't want it to change argue that it's impossible to separate the academic support from the personal support. If you build up a really good relationship with your tutee, you talk about academic matters, and that may then morph into personal matters, problems that the student has, advice that the student needs. Uh, do, you know, do you know the expression door handling? Do you use that here? Well, door handling, I think it, it came from doctors originally, that you go to the doctor's office and you say what's wrong, and as you're just leaving, you've got your hand on the door handle, you say, by the way, doctor, and then you say what is really worrying you, that you haven't actually been able to bring yourself to say before. And that may happen in the advising and, and tutoring situation as well, that somebody comes to see you and then right at the end they say, well, also. Tutors really value, the best tutors really value their relationship with their tutees. And ideally, we have the student keeping the same tutor for the duration of their degree programme. Uh, something that David said about the importance of good support, academic advising for retention and student success is vital to us as well. Research has shown that if you do have good personal tutoring, good academic advising, you are much more likely to stay the course and to succeed. But unfortunately, that can't always happen. Maybe a tutor might leave the university and go somewhere else. Maybe they might have sabbatical leave in order to do research. They might be ill, who knows? So that may change. So that can mean that you don't keep the same tutor for the duration. And that obviously is not, not the most ideal situation. The tutor meets the tutees regularly. Some of these are timetabled meetings, spaced throughout the year. But also the tutee can ask for a meeting or the tutor can ask for a meeting. And the tutor will have office hours when he or she is available to see the students. And the tutor will monitor academic progress, will give advice, will write references, both as the student is applying for jobs and also later on, maybe some years later, they might write and say, will you give me a reference? Unlike the situation here, the tutor doesn't need to give advice on the program that the student is going to take. When I first came to America, my, my first conference was in Pittsburgh years ago. And I was very confused because people kept talking about undeclared students. And I thought, who are these students who are wandering around not declaring to anybody that they are students? <laughs> <laughs> and why isn't anybody challenging them? And then I realised that that's a student who's not said what their major subject is going to be. Well, that doesn't happen with us. In the UK, for the vast majority of degree courses, 
in the October before you want to come, you fill out a form saying what programme you want to do and at what institution. And you can choose five institutions on this form. And you go through the process throughout the year, you take your exams, you get the grades, hopefully, that are asked of you. Um, my, my husband, when he worked in student office once, was staffing the phones in August, and uh, a mother rang up because her son hadn't got the grades that he needed in Latin to do a language course. And he was, he was really nice. He said, don't worry, uh, he's young. He takes the other year out. He retakes the Latin. He passes the Latin. He comes and he succeeds. And there was a silence. And this woman said, from your lips to the ear of God. Yeah. I think he did come. Yeah. So in August, the school results come out and the students go wherever they go, depending on their exam results. But they've already chosen what program they want to do. So they're going to come and do physics or they're going to come and do biology and chemistry or English and history or medicine or law or whatever it may be. We don't have pre-medicine and pre-law. You go straight in to those courses because our school leaving exams are a bit like your APs. They're at that level. And so to do medicine, you'd need to get the equivalent of APs in certainly chemistry and maybe another science and something else and so on. So you go straight into the course you want to do. So the advisor doesn't have to advise you about what course to take. You've already chosen. What he or she may have to advise, though, is after a few weeks, if you hate it or you're just not doing very well at it, what are the options for changing? into another course. Are you going to have to take a year out? Is there another course that you can switch into? And that's an important part of the personal tutor's role. As is choosing elective options. Many programs have electives built in. So you're doing, I don't know, English and history, but you think you need to improve your language skills. So you'd like to do an elective in a modern foreign language. Or maybe you think your ICT skills are not up to par. So you'd like to do an elective in IT. And the tutor then will advise you on what's available, whether you're qualified to do it, and so on. Um, now, there's a big difference in that the personal tutor role is not professionalized. We don't have professional academic advisors, as you do here. They're academics. The part of being, being a personal tutor is an important part of being a lecturer, being an academic, but it's not professionalised. And training for it is very, very patchy. In some places, there is good professional development for it. In other places, there isn't. And normally, it's up to the tutor to take up those chances or not take them up. And that's an issue which I'll, I'll come to. In some institutions or departments, every academic is a personal tutor. I think if you say everybody has to do something, the subtext is everybody can do something. And the subtext of that is, oh, so it's not such a difficult thing to do, is it? And it's not something for which you need particular training, because anyone can do that. And I have very, very strong feelings against that. There are personal tutors who I think are entirely wonderful. Um, and the majority do a really good job. One or two, I personally wouldn't, let within 500 yards of a student with a problem. I really wouldn't. Yeah. And I have heard one personal tutor at an institution at which I didn't work saying, well, after all, in a meeting, once you've said, how are you doing, old chap? OK, jolly good. There's nothing else to say, is there? <laughs> but he was only one. Yeah. So I think being a personal tutor demands attributes, qualities, training, which you really need to have. And that's something which more people in the UK are now thinking. There's increasing pressure on academics to produce high quality research. And that is the number one thing that people are being asked to do. We have something called the research assessment exercise. A lot of the funding comes from student fees, but some of the funding comes still from a government agency called the Higher Education Funding Council. And your institution's research rating will determine to a large part what grants you get. 
to deliver your, your teaching and your support. And so it's absolutely vital that for the institution, for your department, you produce really good quality research. And there's a new assessment exercise, the Teaching Excellence Framework, which is coming in now, which will mirror that, and that is about the excellence of your teaching, what you're providing. There's administration that academics are expected to do. And even those tutors who really value their support role are finding it even harder to make time to do it as well as they really want to. And what is key is the fact that the brownie points, I know, do you have the expression brownie points? Mm -hmm. yeah. The brownie points come first for research, then from teaching, then from administration, and then student support comes in fourth, if you're lucky. And a lot of us think this is a real problem. And so it's catch-22, really, because if you devote a lot of time to student support and to excellent teaching, then you may not have the time to do the excellent research that your colleague down the corridor is doing. And then he or she is going to get promoted, and maybe you're not going to get promoted. And more and more people are thinking, this is, this is a real worry. We've got to do something. So what are the challenges? We've had an increase in student fees over the last few years, two increases. They're now £9,000 a year. When I went to college, I didn't pay any fees. And I had a grant. I had a maintenance grant as well. Um, there's a, it's a feeling of some bitterness that nearly all the people in our government will have been to university at the time when they didn't pay any fees and they had a maintenance grant. But now students pay quite significant fees. And they take out student loans in order to do that. The loans are payable when you reach, after graduation, a certain level of, uh, of salary. So the increase in student fees leads to a demand for better student support. Obviously, people think, well, we're paying all this. What are we getting for it? The teaching, the... Uh, facilities in the university, the libraries, the laboratories, everything else. But we want good support as well. And the parents are demanding this. I don't know if you're familiar with the term helicopter parents. <laughs> yeah. It was Charlie Nutt of Nakada that first introduced me to the concept of helicopter parents. And boy, did that resonate. But personally, I think submarine parents are worse. Because helicopter parents are quite noisy. And you see them coming and you hear them coming and you can take evasive action. Um, submarine parents come along under the water. You don't see them, you don't hear them coming and they pop up and they get you. Um, universities have strict protocols that you don't discuss a student with anyone but that student himself or herself unless the student has given you explicit permission to do that. And that can be a problem with parents who are now funding their students and have, they think they have the right to ask about how they're doing, to ask about what you're providing. I, I had a conversation a little while ago with, uh, on the phone with a mother who said, you are the most obstructive person I've ever talked to in my life. And I thought, wow, that's a real accolade, you know? <laughs> I'm not just average. I'm not just boring. I am really, really obstructive. But, but she wouldn't understand that just because she was giving uh, the daughter the money for the fees, I couldn't discuss her progress. And I said, in any case, our contract is with your daughter. It's, it's not with you. If you give your daughter the money for the fees, that is your private arrangement. But a lot of parents are not happy with that. And I understand why. I do understand why. We have a widening participation agenda. And that varies from institution to institution. We have some institutions which are very research intensive, very high standards, demand very high qualifications from people who come in. And they tend to have perhaps fewer first generation students than others. So that's not always the case. We have other institutions that have a very strong widening participation agenda and want to open up 
opportunities to people who normally wouldn't have had them, whose parents haven't been to university and so on, who don't have that aspiration. And they send people into schools to work with high school students in their last two years to try to raise their aspirations and help them. We have access courses, which are for mature students who haven't got the qualifications to come to university. And they do a one year or a two year access course, which brings them up to the standard that they need for university entrance. Now, widening participation is something which the government really does impress on us that we have to be involved in. And again, there are standards that you have to meet about your widening participation and the number of non-traditional students that you're taking in. And I think that's excellent. I wasn't a widening participation student, but I was a mature student. I was 24 when I went to university. I spent the first year thinking, I'm really not bright enough to be here and somebody is going to discover it at some point quite soon. And uh, Charlie Nutt says that a good tutor, a good advisor, you don't remember what they say, but you remember how they make you feel. And I had a wonderful tutor who said to me, you know, Penny, if they haven't found you out yet, the likelihood is they're not going to. And I always remember that. It's a mantra. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that they have different support needs and we need to concentrate more on many of those students. And it's not a one size fits all tutoring or advising situation. Different groups of students need different support. I was very much involved in students on joint honours, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary programmes. And the traditional personal tutoring structure doesn't really fit that very well. Because say you, you're doing physics and biology, and your personal tutor is from physics. Well, he or she can monitor your progress in physics and can advise. But what do they know about your progress in biology? So they can look it up obviously on the computer, they can look up your record, but they can't necessarily advise you about that part of your degree. The same with arts. If you're doing philosophy in Spanish, you may have a lecturer from Spanish, but he or she may not know anything about philosophy. And a lot of places put in place something like a centre for multidisciplinary studies, for joint honours, combined studies, interdisciplinary studies where that centre takes an overview of your progress. You have a tutor who is not there for your subject-specific academic problems, but is there to look at your academic progress right across the board. And then if you have a subject-specific query, you go to the particular department that delivers that subject. But the centre for interdisciplinary or combined studies, or whatever it might be, takes that overview of your progress and they're able to advise you. So you go for a, a tutoring session and your tutor says, I see you've done brilliantly in subject A. This is really good. You're not doing quite so well in subject B. You discuss it. Why is that? Is it not for you? Do you not like it that much? What do you need to do to pull up your performance in that side? Should you maybe consider changing the focus of your degree? And they, they work quite well. Interdisciplinary and joint programmes are increasingly seen as offering better employment prospects. Because as I'll, I'll mention later, a lot of employers in the UK, they're not that bothered about your degree subject. What they want you to, to show is that you can succeed, you can get good grades, you've got the intellectual ability to do that, but you've developed the transferable skills that we hope people would get from any degree subject, any degree program, not just because you're doing medicine or law or whatever it might be. And interdisciplinary centres and tutors can really help you to see how you have to develop those skills across the board. Also, they give consistent and accurate advice. Say you're doing three subjects. In the first year, a lot of people might do three subjects. They're two main subjects and an elective. And they've got a query. And they go to subject A and they say, oh, I don't know, go and ask department B. And department B says, not sure about that. Department C will be able to tell you. And the poor student is being shunted about 
from place to place. Worse, they may be getting different advice in all three subjects, and it might, none of it might be accurate. And so where you've got a centre in place, you can make sure that people have the expertise to advise people correctly and accurately about the, um, the things that they, they need to know. And as I said, continuity of advice and support does improve students' chances of success. Research has definitely shown that. And there's a growing feeling in many quarters that people offering, advising, tutoring should be appropriately trained. And that, that is growing in strength. Is it acceptable that every academic should be a personal tutor? As I mentioned, don't you need some personal qualities? If you say everyone must do something, does that mean anyone can? It's not such a big deal. Yeah. And the more approachable personal tutors often get overloaded because you go and see your personal tutor, your advisor, and they're not that helpful. And your friend says, oh, go and see Dr. X because she's brilliant and she really helped me. And so suddenly Dr. X has got hordes of people banging on the door who are not her tutees, but she's got the reputation of being helpful. So the... Uh, the thing that comes from that is that poor old Dr. X doesn't get to do much research because her time is taken up with all the people who are coming to see her because she's so good and supportive. And so she doesn't get much promotion. So that's, that's not acceptable. So an issue that we're all talking about is how do we make sure that the role is valued and rewarded in a way that it isn't always now? And if we think we should change... How do we engage our staff in the changes? Because a lot of people are quite resistant to change. They're afraid of it. They're afraid of what it might mean for their own position. Certainly a lot of tutors value their relationship with their tutees and would resist having any part of that taken away and handed over to somebody else. So that's got to be done tactfully. People have got to be brought in so that they support it. And one thing that people are doing is trying to engage academics who then themselves cascade it to other academics because that's always much more um, effective than the university centre saying, you've got to do this. And then the academics say, you don't understand. You, know, you don't know the pressure's on us. But if another academic says, oh, we're doing this and it works for us, that's different. Many institutions are fundamentally rethinking how they deliver student support. I'm engaged at the moment with a colleague in a project for the University of Exeter in Devon in the south of England who are completely changing their personal tutoring system. And I've done some workshops with their senior personal tutors to prepare them for this. Many places now have student support officers and there are lots of different titles. And they're trained to deliver the non-academic student support. So they won't help you with your... Portuguese literature module or your medical anatomy class. They will help you with things to do with the structure of degrees, perhaps your personal problems. Uh, they will help you with general things that you are concerned about in the university. And they will give you, hopefully, proper, accurate academic advice. And they work in conjunction with the academic personal tutors. So the academic personal tutors still deliver the subject-specific advice, but they work with the student support officers. And they work with the other university services, careers, medical services, chaplaincy, accommodation, and so on. Um, I know all my American colleagues find it very funny that when I was a residential advisor in a hall of residence. My title was warden. And um, <laughs> that's not what we call it. A prison warder is a warder in the UK. I was a warden. But I had a, a lovely JYA student from California. And every morning when I met him on the path from my house, he'd say, morning, Warden Robinson. And he, he found that incredibly funny. Um, and so it's important that there is close liaison between all the services. When I was a warden, it was 
really helpful that I was also an academic and I knew a lot of people in the university. And if we had a student that we thought was in trouble, and people would be brilliant. The other students would come and say, I think so-and-so has got a problem. She hasn't come out of our room for ages. Or the cleaners would come and say, you know, I think so-and-so is worried. Because often the students would talk to the cleaners like they would to their mother or their aunt or somebody. And then I would be able to talk to the academic department or to counselling or whatever it might be. So that, that liaison is important. But we don't think that any one model is necessarily the right one. It's the right one for your institution. And we certainly don't think that the UK model is better than the American model at all. Uh, we're learning a lot from you, and hopefully we're exchanging good practice and ideas. And we've recently, in March last year, set up something called UCAT, um, which some people think, I called it that because I love cats, but it wasn't. Um, it's UK Advising and Tutoring. And it's the first allied group of NACADA outside um, North America. And we hope that's going to provide a forum for lots of people to come together and discuss and share best practice. And we have a, a one-day conference coming in November, which Karen is going to come to. Some other American colleagues are going to come to. Somebody from the Netherlands, some people from Ireland. And hopefully discuss and learn from each other. Peer mentoring is a big thing in quite a lot of uh, institutions. Uh, the one I was at, Leeds, peer mentors are trained and they get a certificate at the end which is pre presented to them by the vice chancellor. It goes on their student record, it can go on their CV and uh, enhance what they can offer to an employer. And it can be, it can be very good because often a student will talk to their peer mentor about something that they might not want to go and talk to the advisor about, or something that they think, oh, everybody else knows this, I'm the only person who doesn't know this, which certainly is not true. I once had a student came to see me, and she was worried about whether she should leave the university. It was family problems at home. And on the third visit, she came to see me with her peer mentor, who was, I think, a third year. She was a first year. And the peer mentor had helped her to write out on a sheet all the issues and the for and against leaving. And that was brilliant. In the end, she left, but that was the right thing to do. It wasn't a failure. She left and she went to a university near her home where she could cope with the family problems. But the peer mentor was, was excellent there. And some institutions are developing online resources to make the meetings more useful and encourage the students to think actively and reflectively before they have a meeting with the tutor or advisor. Have a look at Leeds for Life and Newcastle Plus. If you put them in um, on your search engine, they will come up. Leeds for Life provides web forms which the student has to complete reflectively before each meeting and email to the tutor. And that gives a structure for the discussion. And it forces the student to really think about what we're asking. And the Leeds model for personal tutoring gives tutors advice about what should be done progressively in each meeting during each year of the programme to lead the student on to think about different things. Often they don't want to do it at the beginning. They, they don't see the point or they're not used to thinking reflectively about their experience. But it gets better. At the end of the meeting, the student and the tutor agree outcomes and goals to be achieved before the next meeting. They are filled in on the electronic form. Both the tutor and student sign up to it. And the only people who can see this, that there's a, a tutor dashboard and a student dashboard, the only people who can see it are the student, the tutor, and one other person who's usually an administrator. And that is so if anything happens to the tutor and they leave or they're ill or whatever, there is one other person who has access. Right. And what we hope it will do will be help students to identify and value their skills and competencies and attributes. Because I don't know what it's like here, but I find first-year student will come and I say, right, what... Well, Imagine I'm your potential employer. You know, what skills have you got to offer me? What competencies? What attributes? <gasps> I haven't got any. You know, 
And they have. They've got masses. But they're just not used to thinking about it. What, what's it like here? Do people value and identify what they can do? <laughs> it's quite surprising, really, because you dig down and, and you look at their application form and you see, oh, you, you were in the scout movement and you were a leader. What, what did you learn from that? You led people. You were captain of the football team. What skills did you need dealing with people in the football team? Oh, yeah, you know. But they really need to have it dragged out of them. And what we find at the beginning is students think we and employers are interested only in what they do in the classroom situation and what they learn at university and not what they might have learned outside in their other co-curricular activities, home, whatever. For instance, to do an unusual language at Leeds, and Leeds has a big um, language provision, you can do honours degrees in French, German, Spanish, Portuguese, Arabic, Chinese, Italian, you name it. And for the ones that most people haven't learnt before coming to university, we ask for evidence of competence in language learning. And that usually means uh, a high grade in school leaving language. So if you want to do Portuguese, if you've got an A grade in A level French, we'll teach you Portuguese because you've, you've shown you can learn it. But if you've shown that you can learn a language in another way, because uh, culturally you're bilingual, you come from a bilingual family, because maybe you learnt a language for religious reasons, maybe you lived abroad for a certain part of your life, that will do. It's the outcomes that matter, not how you achieve those outcomes. But students often don't see that. They think, oh, no, I haven't got a, an exam pass in it. Yeah. Employability is a, a major issue for us. As I said, a lot of students can't identify the skills, competencies, attributes that they have. They don't even know that they have them, and we have to help them to identify them. One big issue, they think work experience, building up a good CV is something you can leave till second or even final year. No. Um, I've had people say, my mum says first year is for enjoying yourself. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm not your mum, and I don't think that. And increasingly, employers want things that you've done, experience, and so on, right from the moment you hit the university. You've got to hit the ground running on that one. And it's quite hard sometimes to convince them of that. And, you know, you try to convince them to do things like, well, join a student society, run for office. Um, join a sports team, try and uh, be captain or whatever. Uh, if there's going to be a, a ball in your Hall of Residence, get on the organising committee. Um, so we try and persuade people of that sort of thing. And they don't realise that knowledge and skills gained anywhere are important. It does not have to be inside the university. Right. So it's your job now. Talk to somebody sitting near you and try and identify your own skills, competencies, and personal qualities. <laughs> what do you think the graduate recruiters wanted more than anything else? Uh, time management. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said time management. That was one of the top five. It wasn't the top one. Okay. I think problem solving is the top one. That was in there, not the top one. Yeah, it was communication. Number one was communication. And there was time management and there was problem solving. So that's three. Any others? Teamwork. Teamwork. Absolutely vital. Teamwork. I, uh, some years ago, was on a higher education funding council team. And we used to go around to several universities and just assess their provision. You'd, you'd go in for three and a half days and assess their provision in a certain subject area. I was on the modern languages team. It was a hit team, you know. It went in. We, we went in from Monday afternoon to Thursday morning, and they would make sure that the, the worst lecturers always taught on a Friday or a Monday morning, you know. Um, 
and we went to a certain university, which shall be nameless, but has anybody seen Morse or Lewis? Ooh, so you know. And I was talking to this lovely chap who was an Italian lecturer. Not Italian, he was English, but he taught Italian, fairly elderly. And I'd noticed that they had a gender deficit in their highest degrees, that it was looking harder for women to get the highest degrees than men. And the University of Cambridge had done some research into it and had sort of come up with the idea that the qualities that were most prized were more male qualities. I have to be really careful here, don't I? More male qualities, like taking a risk with judgments, saying something maybe before you'd totally sort it through, but being creative. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm women. <laughs> women were more um, cautious and wouldn't say something until they'd really thought it through. And so I said to him, have you looked at this gender deficit you've got? And he looked stunned because he had no idea what a gender deficit was anyway. And then he said, well, my dear, which is a really good start, you know, well, my dear, you do have to realise that women do have less staying power than men. Oh, is that what it is? I never knew. Who knew? Yeah. yeah um, Things not to say. Women. What do you think was the bottom one that they were less concerned with? Subject knowledge. Oh, well done, yeah, absolutely. Subject knowledge. And because unless you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer, or an engineer. That's not the most important thing. OK, if you're going to be a doctor, some subject knowledge would be good. If you're going to be an engineer, you know, I, I don't want your bridge to fall on me when I'm passing underneath it. But other things, they will teach you what they need you to know. But they will look for the transferable skills, not the subject-specific skills. How do you think the final year students rank them? Digital footprint. Uh, no, it wasn't, actually. It probably should have been. I think they put degree subject knowledge up towards the top. They did. Number one was degree subject knowledge. Wow. So they really thought, because they were doing physics or English or philosophy or whatever, that that was what the, the employer would want. And it isn't. They, they want you to have excelled, because that shows that you're intellectually capable of learning things and doing well. But that's not the most important thing. We also talked to employers. And at that university, intellectually, it's so intensive and students are excellent. They do a lot of one-to-one -one teaching, tutor and one student, tutor and two students. And the employer said, yeah, they're brilliant. They really are intellectually brilliant. They can't do teamwork because they've never done any. They've never done group work. They, they don't know how to interact with other people. They, don't, they can't judge when in a group you take the lead and when you encourage somebody else to take the lead. That just didn't happen. Whereas at some other universities it does because group work is built into the curriculum. And we have to see how we can embed into the curriculum the sort of skills that, um, that employers want. So, an overview. I think our aims and objectives are very similar even though we're going about it traditionally in different ways. We are changing. We're adopting some of the, the US ideas. But we're, we're in the same business. We want the same things from our students. We want them to achieve academic excellence and have strong skills. We want them to be confident. We want them to be able to identify and value and articulate their skills and contribute to the betterment of their society which is an important thing, which is built in as well. Not saying that one system is better than the other. Some systems are appropriate for certain situations, but we can learn from each other. And sharing good practice, learning from each other, hopefully will get us there. As your president said, um, what did your president say? I've forgotten it. We can do this. We can do this.